Ponziano here. In 2017, I hiked the PCT southbound, and in this video, I'd like to share three things I wish I had known before hiking the PCT. Number one is gonna be how to deal with early season snow conditions. Before I hiked the trail, I had almost no snow experience, and so I was uh, definitely nervous about the conditions I was going to encounter, uh, whether or not I would even be able to do it safely, um, the gear I would need, and in even a slightly above average snow year, and definitely in a high snow year like 2017, there's going to be a lot of sensationalism online, particularly in the Facebook group, about all of these things, the snow levels, who's going to be experienced enough, the gear that you'll need, a safe start date, and it seems like there are people who would have you believe that you can't hike the PCT in a higher snow year without all this mountaineering experience. And I don't think that's true. I think that, like I said, I hiked the PCT with little snow experience, and I think that most people can with a good amount of common sense and also research and planning beforehand. So what do I mean by research and planning? Uh, mainly I mean looking up the snow levels for yourself. And <clears throat> there are a number of resources online where you can do this. I think that the most helpful is postholer.com and I'll link that down in the description. Postholer has uh, several different graphs and charts that uh, are going to show you the, the snow depth. One of them uh, shows you the snow depth for every single mile marker of the trail using what they call remote sensing. They have another one that is a Google map overlay that uh, is color coded and shows the snow depth. And all of this shows you the snow levels uh, relative to the yearly average. Uh, so that's going to be really important for uh, determining whether it is a super high snow year or just a little bit above average. The next thing uh, that I found really helpful in my preparation was Andrew Skirka's blog series on hiking in early season conditions. It's going to cover pretty much anything you would want to know from the gear that you'll want to have, a uh, clothing system, how to cross snow, how to cross rivers, um, how to navigate. It was super helpful for me and I think it would be for anybody planning a through hike so I will link that down below as well. I also want to talk about the two main pieces of gear that you're going to hear that you need in a higher snow year. Those are going to be micro spikes and ice axe. And in a higher snow year, I uh, definitely do recommend having both of those things and knowing how to use them. But I think it's important to know what their intended uses are and also what the limitations of these pieces of gear are. And I'll, I'll start with the micro spikes pretty much just slips over your shoe, they go over trail runners or boots, and they have spikes that are held together by these chains. And these are basically intended for hiking on hard packed snowy trails that are not too steep. They can handle a little bit of ice. Uh, they aren't very useful on soft snow because the snow can ball up underneath them. And like I said, they're not great on anything steep. Um, but now on the PCT, you are gonna have some steep traverses where you have to cross a side hill over a steep slope. And if you want to use micro spikes for this, you can't just uh, flat foot across the slope and depend on these spikes because because they are held together by chains, they're not going to really support your body weight if you try to do that. They're not crampons. Um, and so you would have a good chance of falling if you did that. So if you are going to take these on steeper slopes, so you have to make sure you're kicking really good steps. And kicking steps just means, um, you know, with your foot, kicking level platforms into the snow so that your foot can just, just stick in there and, and get some decent purchase. Really, you shouldn't, like, trust your life to micro spikes uh, just because of the nature of their design. And I wanted to show you, um, right here you can see that mine are starting to come apart, the rubber strap. And I've only had these for a couple of years and they haven't seen a whole lot of use. So, yeah, these are not crampons. They're just meant to aid in traction a little bit. Pretty much a good rule of thumb is that you're, you can't really use micro spikes for anything more than what you could do with just your shoes and kicking good steps. Microspikes are not suitable for like 
super steep, super hard stuff. Thankfully, there's not really much of that on the PCT. Um, most of the snow that you'll encounter on the PCT, you could do with just your um, trail running shoes. The micro spikes are just going to give you a little bit more traction than you would have otherwise. If you really wanted um, like some very serious traction, like if you were going into the Sierras like they were in 2017 and it's just going to be totally snow covered um, and you know it's going to be really intense, then I would probably recommend looking at uh, the Catula K10 crampons, which are more like a regular crampon, but they're still for like hiking shoes and trail runners. If you do have to cross steeper snow, it's uh, much safer to do that when the snow is softer, and the snow softens up throughout the day, so by noon it'll be pretty easy to kick steps into. And also, if you were to slide and fall on softer snow, you're going to pick up much less speed than if the snow was hard. Um, if you do come to something that looks pretty sketchy, it might not be a bad idea to like just take a break and wait and see if it softens up a little bit. Yeah, so the next thing you're going to hear that you need is an ice axe. And the main purpose of an ice axe is to self-arrest, um, but honestly I think it's not very likely that you're going to have to do that on the PCT because most of the traverses are just not that difficult. Um, but of course, I do think you need to know how to do it. Um, at the very least, you should watch some videos and practice uh, independently. I carried an ice axe but didn't use it and never felt like I needed it in 2017. Keep in mind, I started up in the Cascades in mid-July, so I had a bit of a late start. So there actually wasn't a whole lot of snow, even though it was a high snow year. There was a warm spring. And I guess I didn't fully understand the utility of an ice axe for through hiking. But uh, in 2018, I did use one for just a little bit um, on some snow in early July in the Cascades. And what I found was that um, it felt much more secure when used as the crutch in my uphill hand than my trekking pole did. And that sounds kind of obvious, but I mean, it makes a lot of sense. The, the ice axe is much more rigid and you can really drive it into the snow and feel a lot more confident. And obviously if you had to self-arrest or even self-belay, which is just where you kind of grab the bottom of the axe and stop yourself from sliding if you happen to slip, it's gonna be much more realistic and possible with an axe than with a trekking pole, especially if the snow is hard. Yeah, so that's all for early season snow. Um, the second thing I wish I had known is how to deal with snow storms and cold temperatures in late September and early October. And this will uh, apply to southbounders in the Sierras or northbounders up in Washington. Um, in 2017, we got snowed on for two days and we're facing temperatures in the mid-teens at night and hardly getting above freezing during the day. Neither I nor the people I was with were adequately prepared for this. Uh, we pretty much had summer clothing. I didn't even have anything to start a fire with. And so it was a little bit of a scary situation and could have been a whole lot better if we had just been better prepared. So I want to share a gear list for shoulder season hiking that I kind of put together and used in 2018. I'll link it down in the description, but right now I just want to highlight a few of the key things that make it different from what I would use in the summer. I'll start with the clothing. First of all, I'm going to change my base layer. Um, I just use a thin polyester base layer in the summer, but um, when maybe mid or late September rolls around, I'm going to change that to a long sleeve merino wool base layer with a hood um, and this just makes a huge difference um, it's it's really nice to have you know something a little bit thicker and more form-fitting and the hood is really good for regulating temperature the next thing is going to be your upper body insulation um, in the summer I would normally just have a really thin probably synthetic puffy jacket but uh, when shoulder season comes around, I'm going to want to have two pieces of insulation, one active and one for just sitting around at camp and sleeping in. The active layer is going to be something pretty thin, like maybe a hundred weight fleece like this, or this is a cheap one, but you could also use like a Patagonia R1, or you could use a really thin synthetic puffy jacket as well if it's going to be even colder, like if, it's, if you do think it's going to be in the teens at night. Uh, for the I guess you could say the static layer, the rest layer. Um, 
I like to have a really big puffy. I didn't have one in 2017, and I feel like if I did, I, I would have been a lot safer and a lot more comfortable. Uh, this is actually what I use now. Um, this is a pretty big puffy down jacket. It's the Montbell Mirage Parka, and it might seem like overkill, but it's still pretty light. It's only 13 ounces, but it has uh, five ounces of 900 fill power down. So it's a pretty warm jacket. It's almost like a winter parka, but like with very light materials and a little bit less warm than that. And you know, I'm gonna wear that at night and in the morning when I'm uh, setting up and breaking camp and I'm gonna sleep in it and it's gonna give a really big boost to my uh, sleep system. And I think it just gives you like an extra layer, an extra margin of safety in those kind of conditions. So I think that's important. If you want a synthetic option for that, uh, I would look at the Nun Attack PCT jacket um, in probably like the 3.6 ounce uh, fill option. Uh, for rain gear, even this past year I still used frog togs um, in shoulder season and I don't know if I'm going to keep doing that. I might get like a more burly rain jacket for those kind of conditions, but this last year I still used frog togs and frog togs are not warm at all because they're so baggy. So what I did was I, I used a wind shirt underneath it and that helped to trap a lot more heat. So I do recommend that. Um, if you don't, if you're like using frog togs and you don't want to have like a whole nother rain jacket. For my rain, or for my pants, I have rain pants instead of wind pants because they're uh, going to trap a lot more heat and they're going to be more, much more water resistant. Underneath them I have uh, mid-weight tights. Um, it don't, doesn't really matter what brand or whether they're polyester or wool, just mid-weight tights. Uh, for my hands, I prefer mittens instead of uh, fingered gloves. Right now I, I have these, which are um, the Outdoor Research 400 weight fleece mittens. Yeah, mittens are just nice because your fingers can sort of like share the heat in there and yeah, they just stay a little bit warmer. And over top of them I have rain mitts. These are the Bora Gear rain mittens, and you can see I did a very sloppy job of seam sealing them. But seam sealing rain mitts is important, at least with most of them that don't come seam taped, uh, otherwise they're gonna leak. Uh, for my socks, I'm gonna have three different pairs of socks, which uh, may seem like a lot, but it's, uh, I think it's a pretty good system. Um, the first pair is just gonna be my usual hiking socks, which are uh, thin nylon dress socks, which it works for me, but it's not going to work for everybody. Uh, the next pair is going to be a just like any fuzzy, warm pair of socks. Like you could get these anywhere. Uh, they're light <coughs> and pretty warm, and they stay at the bottom of my pack inside the liner, and I only wear them to sleep in. Uh, the third pair is going to be a mid-weight pair of hiking socks, and this is just so that I have something much warmer to hike in if I do have to walk through snow. Uh, which we did in 2017 um, up on the passes there was like almost a foot of snow in some places and uh, my feet were just extremely cold in my thin socks so those uh, mid-weight socks are pretty much just for insurance in case you do get a decent amount of snow and you have to walk through it. Uh, another very important thing you should be carrying is a fire starting kit. Uh, in 2017 we did have to have one fire that I thought was pretty critical and like I said, I didn't have any fire starting stuff, so I was just lucky that one of the people I was with did. Um, we needed to have a fire to dry out our sleeping bags and clothes that had gotten totally wet from snow and condensation. And so now I definitely do carry a fire starting kit um, when I think I'm going to be going into challenging conditions. And for me, that's just going to be a little box of matches and some cotton balls and a little thing of Vaseline in a Ziploc bag. And the cotton balls and Vaseline are just so you have uh, a little bit of kindling to get your fire going when everything on the ground is wet. One thing that I'll add is that I generally wouldn't have a fire unless it was an emergency, especially in places like the Sierras that are very prone to wildfires. And also make sure that you know how to start a fire before you get out there and you don't want your first time making a fire to be under stressful conditions. So just have a little practice fire at home before you get out there. Uh, number three, the third thing I wish I had known is that you're probably going to have fire closures. 
I didn't know anything about fire closures before I hiked the trail, and I definitely didn't know they were going to be such a big part of my experience. Fire closures happen every year on the PCT now. Some people are lucky enough to get through the whole trail without um, hitting a fire closure, but it's honestly much more likely that you are. And when you do hit a fire closure, you're going to be you're going to have two options. One option is going to be to hike a detour around it, and the other is going to be to just hitchhike around it. And the detour could be as short and easy as a 15 mile walk on a dirt road, or it could be as obnoxious as a 50 mile walk on a highway with a narrow shoulder, as was the case for the Jefferson fire in 2017 in Oregon. And there's not really anything you can do about these fire closures, you just have to adapt. But I think that one thing you can do ahead of time is have a plan for whether you're going to um, walk or hitch fire closures based on whether having a continuous footpath is important to you. A continuous footpath just means an unbroken chain of steps from Canada to Mexico or wherever you're going. And this matters to some people because a through hike is like this big epic journey and when you get in a car and skip ahead even a small amount um, it really kind of can break that up a little bit and ruin the illusion of that big epic journey. I do want to stress that it is not important or necessary or anything like that to have a continuous footpath. If the trail is closed, it's closed and there's nothing you can do about it. Especially on a trail like the PCT, which is so affected by fire and which is such a defined route, um, if, if it's closed, the trail just doesn't exist. And uh, if you don't want to do a sketchy highway detour, you don't have to. It doesn't make you more or less of a hiker. And if you do decide to hitch around a closure, it's not the end of the world. The trail will still be there and you can come back the next year and hike what you missed. Uh, that's what I did. Uh, in 2017, I hitched around some closures, and in 2018, I just came back and did a big section hike and picked up the stuff that I missed. All you want to do is have that plan set ahead of time for what you're going to do so that when you do encounter a fire closure, you uh, don't have to sit around in town stressing about uh, what you want to do. You can just you can have your plan and you can just execute it and stick to it. And that way you're just going to be you know, much more efficient in dealing with fire closures and you're not going to have any regrets later on. So yeah, just be ready to adapt and have your priorities straight um, before you hit the trail and you should be good. But yeah, fire closures are an unfortunate reality of through hiking. So that's it. Those are the three things that, um, the three main things that I wish I had known, or at least been more aware of before I hiked the PCT. I hope that you found this video helpful. Uh, if you did, please hit the like button and subscribe. And um, if you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments section, and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, yeah, so that's it. I'll see you next time, and good luck on your through hike.